Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the second exam review session. I'm just going to write up the list of general topics we're going to cover. So for this exam we saw positive feedback, with comparators, we talked about inductors and RL circuits and such, then we extended that into RLC circuits. And then one of our tools for analyzing RLC circuits, we started talking about the impedance method. Then from that, we were able to design different types of filters and analyze those filters with Bode plots and talk about quality factors and bandwidths and stuff like that. So we're going to try to just hit all of these topics, go over the basics, do a few examples, but please, if you have questions about anything, just call them out. Um, so positive feedback, right? We started when we were talking about op-amps, right? We had our positive terminal, our negative terminal, this was the output, and we also had our power rails, which we often sort of ignored, but they might be like, you know, 15 volts and then minus 15 volts. And we had our ideal op-amp assumption, right? So we said that like I plus equals I minus is equal to zero. So no current going into the inputs here. And then we also said, very importantly, that V plus equals V minus, right? So whatever circuit we had, these two points would be at roughly the same voltage. And one simple circuit that we talked about was basically just a voltage follower. So we had something like this where like this would be you know, some input voltage, whatever that may be, that would be going into this terminal, and then the negative terminal is connected to the output. And because these points are at roughly the same voltage, we said that V in was also at the negative input terminal and therefore went to the output, but this allowed us to sort of isolate different stages of our circuit. So just from this, just from the rules we used to derive that, we could have just as easily flipped which side of the op-amp we used. We could have applied Vn to our negative terminal and then connected our positive terminal to the output, right? We didn't distinguish anything between the negative and positive input terminals. But this is not going to work as you want it to. And the reason, fundamentally, is to remember that the way op-amps really work is that V out is really equal to A times V plus minus V minus, where A is some really huge gain factor that we're saying is you know, going to infinity. It's not actually going to be infinite in real life, but it's very, very large. And so we said basically, you know, if we make V plus minus V minus roughly close to zero, then zero times infinity, quote unquote, will get us some finite voltage at the output, which is what we're actually going to get. So, the problem here is, as we currently have things set up with this positive feedback, if there is any noise introduced to our systems, right, just random fluctuations or external environment adding into our system, what if this voltage changes a little bit, right? What if V plus becomes just a little bit larger than V minus by any tiny amount? Well, what's going to happen is if V plus is larger than V minus, then this value becomes positive, and it's multiplied by some huge gain value A. So now V out is going to be a lot bigger. But if V out over here is bigger, well, that ties right back into V plus. So then V plus is going to get bigger, and then this value is going to get even bigger, multiplied by the huge gain A, and V out is going to get even larger, and it's just going to keep feeding itself, that's positive feedback. It's adding to our deviation from our desired equilibrium. And so what's going to end up happening is it's just going to max out at our 15 volt power rail. Whatever this power rail is, it's just going to max out right around there. Similarly, if V plus had gotten a little bit less than V minus, then this would have been negative, would have been multiplied by a huge gain A, and V out would have gone really big negative, and we would have hit our minus 15 volt rail. So this is why positive feedback is not going to work the way negative feedback does. If we had negative feedback, then the exact opposite would have happened. 
because then these would be flipped, and basically, if V out got a little bit larger than we wanted, then it would... Okay, I should actually show this. If we have these flipped again so that we're using negative feedback, which is how we generally like to use our op amps, now, if V minus becomes a little bit larger than V plus, that means that this value is going to be negative, multiplied by A, so V out is going to go down. But when V out goes down, it pulls V minus back down with it. And so it then restabilizes to V minus and V plus being about the same. So that's why negative feedback stays stable and positive feedback just, you know, gets further and further from equilibrium. Yeah? So are we assuming that, um, there, that, that the port that's being fed by the source cannot fluctuate like that? The port that's being sold by the... It's being fed by the source. It's being fed by the source. You mean, like, what if this were fluctuating yeah. a little bit? I mean, basically the same... The, like, if, if this changes, right, the way this circuit is designed is for the output voltage, which is tied to V minus, to roughly equal V plus. And so, like, when we set it up like this with negative feedback so that it stays stable, this voltage should always stabilize to this voltage. So, like, if V in changed a little bit, it would just stabilize such that V out equaled that changed V in. But because the, because to answer your question more directly, this input port, this input terminal that is being fed by the source, it's not connected in any way to the output directly. There's no feedback going on there. So this whole notion of the stability that we've set up based on the feedback mechanism, that is kind of separate from fluctuations in other parts of our circuit. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So one way to think about it is that there's this negative sign in front of the V minus, uh, and that's what's, what's making V minus the port that you want to have feedback to. So if V minus increases, then because there's a negative sign, V out will decrease. So you want, you want that balance to be connected to whatever has the negative sign. So if this were flipped, which it's not, then you would do it the other way. So one thing is you might be thinking that you know, positive feedback is always bad. It's not always bad. Generally, when we have positive feedback, we're going to call this a comparator rather than an op amp. But you can think about it kind of like an op amp just with positive feedback. But I mean, one time when it will be useful to you to use positive feedback with comparator is if we have this circuit, which as we said, if V plus is larger than V minus, then we're going to shoot off to 15 volts. And if V plus is less than V minus, we'll go down to minus 15 volts. You know, you could set up some more complicated circuit here in order to basically see, are we above or below V in? Right, so positive feedback isn't always bad, and we're going to show an example now of a time when it is useful in an oscillator. Um, so I mean, I can draw the. So if we look at this circuit, it, it does have negative feedback, but it also has positive feedback. And so it's going to have this you know, positive feedback mechanism where it's basically going to shoot to opposite ends. And the way this is going to work is that this and these two sides are kind of isolated from one another. The only shared point is this V out point. But at any <coughs> given time, this basically just forms a voltage divider because we have no current going into the positive port here. And so this point is always going to be at V out over 2, since the two resistors are equal in resistance. And so basically what that means is that because this has this positive feedback, if this point, if V minus, is larger than V out over 2, well, that would mean that because the negative port, because V minus is larger than V plus, V out is going to max out at the negative power rail. 
So we'll say that V out equals you know, minus 15 volts. And we're assuming here once again that we have the plus and minus 15 volt power rules. These can be anything. Um, alternatively, if V minus is less than V out over 2, then the opposite thing will happen. V plus will be larger than V minus, and so V out is going to max out at R. Positive 15 volts. So now, right, if this is at the switching point, basically what it's going to look like is if V out is at 15 volts, right, that means that this capacitor should be charging up, right? And it's going to keep charging up with current going into it through the resistor until the voltage here reaches V out over 2, until it reaches, you know, 7.5 volts, at which point V minus will be larger than V plus, and then V out is going to shoot down to minus 15 volts. So then the capacitor is going to be charging down to minus 15 volts until it reaches, you know, V out over 2, and then it's going to it's going to keep flipping back and forth. So the way that's going to look, um, trying to think the best way. So the easiest way to think about this is if we assume, for a moment, and we'll see why this is a reasonable thing to start with, that this point started at minus v out over two. Say that. This is V out, and this is minus V out. So say that this point, this is V minus, started at minus V out over 2. And that the power rail at that point, or sorry, no, it should just be V out over 2. Oh wait, sorry. V out is not clear because I mean the actual power rail though. Sorry. Let's just call this 15 minus 15. <coughs> so we're starting at like the capacitor is fully charged, there's no current flowing through the path from V naught to through the capacitor. So this is kind of a reasonable starting condition. Right, so if V out, let's put this in. If V out starts up here at 15 volts, but V minus started at minus 7.5 volts, well, because of that, this is just going to look like an RC circuit, and the capacitor is going to want to charge up to the value of V out. So it's going to start doing this thing. But as soon as it hits 7.5 volts, now V minus has just reached V out over 2. And as soon as it gets just a, a bit above that, well now V out is going to shoot down to minus 15 volts. So now V out is down here. But now if V out's at minus 15 volts, well now this capacitor is starting at 7.5 volts, it's going to try to charge down to this V out value. So now it's going to start discharging. But then as soon as it hits minus 7.5 volts, well now it's going to be less than V out over 2. And so V out is going to shoot back up to 15 volts. And things are just going to keep going like this on and on. And so we've just built for ourselves an oscillator. V out is just going to keep you know, charging up and down and up and down, basically, or this value, sorry, V out is just going to shoot back and forth between plus and minus 15. This V minus point is going to be charging up and down and up and down between plus and minus 7.5 volts. So if you wanted some sort of oscillator, you know, you could use V out as like a clock for something. If you had your RC time constant tuned to what you wanted your clock speed to be, this could, you know, totally be a square wave or something like that. So positive feedback can be used, um, you know, effectively when used properly. Any questions on positive feedback or comparators before we move on? Awesome.
Cam is inductors. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Uh, so what is an inductor? You have this. Current going in, voltage, and we have a relationship. <coughs> voltage is L, DI, DT. Um, okay, so one useful thing that I find when thinking about inductors is they're very similar to capacitors, except you basically flip current and voltage. Right, for a capacitor, the current is proportional to the, to the time derivative of the voltage. With inductors, it's the opposite. Now, the voltage is proportional to the time derivative of the current. And basically, with anything we're going to say about inductors, if you take what you think about capacitors, flip current and voltage, and replace capacitance with inductance, it'll probably be the correct thing for an inductor. <coughs> Um, one other thing to note is that in terms of series and parallel combinations for an inductor, inductors are like resistors. So if this is inductance L1, inductance L2, this is equivalent to a single inductor with inductance L1 plus L2, but this parallel combination equivalent to a single inductor with, you know, L1 times L2 over L1 plus L2. That's the, you know, L1 parallel with L2 formula, just like a resistor. And so going back to what Jacob was saying is that all of the relationships between inductors and capacitors are kind of the opposite. So series inductors are kind of the opposite formula as series capacitors and vice versa. So, first thing we did when we made circuits with inductors was just an RL circuit. So it's like an RC circuit, except now we have an inductor. So we have our input voltage. Input voltage, resistor, inductor. We can measure the output across the resistor or inductor, in this case, just the inductor. So just starting from you know first principles from KCL, since this is one loop, we know that we have the same current flowing through everything. So let's just call that current capital I. Um, using you know device laws, we see that the voltage across the resistor VR is R times I. And then because of the inductor with its device law, we have the VL equals L di dt. And then from KVL, we know that Vn is equal to Vr plus Vl. So if we replace Vr and Vl with these formulas, then we see that Vn is, or we should actually do it in reverse. Right, Vl is equal to V out. So if we rewrite this formula, we have the V out, which equals V L, equals V in minus V R. Um, it's not clear exactly what to do with this because we have V R in terms of I. We need to figure out what I is. So replacing all of these with these formulas, we have L D I D T equals V in minus R I. Should have left it the other way. Um, we'll get L di dt plus ri equals vn. Right, so now we just have a first order differential equation. We'll solve it as we usually do. Um, this looks fairly similar to the RC circuit equation that we would have had, except there now we're going to get an r over L for our time constant instead of RC as our time constant but it'll basically look exactly the same um, as before. Um, 
See, so yeah, I can solve this if anybody wants me to, but it's just a... Um, all right, so for the homogeneous response, right, if we set V into zero for a moment, then we would have di dt um, sorry. di dt plus r over l i equals zero. So then, right, if we have it in our usual exponential form, we'll have that i equals some amplitude a times e to the minus t over r over l, right? Because r over l is, is tau. Um, and then a, we're going to figure out later based on initial conditions, which I haven't provided in this problem. Um, for the particular solution, it's always nicest to just assume that i is constant so that the di dt term goes away. So for our particular solution, we'll just have that, you know, i equals vn over r. Um, assuming that vn is just a constant value. If vn weren't constant, um, this would be more complicated. But if vn is constant, then this makes i constant, which means that the idt goes to zero, and this is a valid particular solution. So our total solution for i would be, you know, vn over r plus a e to the minus t over r over l. And as I said before, depending on initial conditions for, you know, anything, um, we could figure out what a is and then get a total solution for i. From that, if we differentiate this and multiply by L, we'll get V out. And this is a point we're going to come back to later, but when you're solving differential equations, you have your total solution is equal to your homogeneous solution plus your particular solution. Your homogeneous solution satisfies that the differential equation on the, you know, for here, the, right, the left-hand side is equal to zero. And so when you add the homogeneous and particular solutions, you'll get the homogeneous part, which equals zero, plus the particular part, which equals your, your V in, so that when you sum the two things, this term will, will satisfy the, the zero part of the differential equation. And why this matters is that, when, is that your homogeneous solution, that's what gave us this A value that we would solve depending, we would figure it out depending on what the initial conditions are. So A and homogeneous, comes from initial conditions. <coughs> okay. I, also, I feel like this should be an L over R. Maybe I made a mistake. L over R, yeah. Sorry, That's this should be L It's your time R. constant though, so. Yeah. Okay. So now moving to RLC circuits. We'll do the example for a series RLC. And here, when we had an R and an L, that gave us a first order uh, differential equation. When we have an RLC circuit, that's going to give us a second order differential equation. And that's because L has a derivative and the capacitor has a derivative. And they go in different ways. So it's kind of, it adds up. Um, And let's say we're measuring the voltage across the capacitor. So I'm going to call this V out. Okay, so... One quick thing to note is I feel like it's often just because we draw our circuits this way because it's convenient and I do recommend that when you're drawing a circuit you draw it this way because this is how we usually draw it. You just measure V out across like the bottom right component or anything. We could measure V out across anywhere. It could be across the R, L, or C, or across any you know combination of them. Um, just just keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. So we go through and we're writing our equation. So we have V in minus R I, and let's define some current going through the circuit. Minus R times I minus L D I dt minus v out, or v capacitor, equals zero. We need to figure out v, v out, 
So we have this relationship for the capacitor that V out, uh, that I is equal to C D V out DT. So we see that if we, we have this equation in I and this equation in V out, where V in is kind of our, our constant, um, so we can solve these two equations to either have one equation written in terms of I or one equation written in terms of V out. So for, for right now, let's write it in terms of V out. Uh, but Jacob did the same thing, but written in terms of I. Uh, OK, so then we have V in minus R C D V out D T minus L C D two V out minus V out equals zero. We want to generally we want to write our differential equations in a standard form where you start from the highest derivative and you give it uh, a co coefficient of one. So we'll rewrite it as d two v out d two plus. So Hannah um, is basically just moving yeah. these three terms to the other side and then dividing through by L C. some sort of exponential, then when you differentiate an exponential, right, you're basically pulling down that exponent. So if v out were like e to the st, then the second derivative would be s squared e to the st, and the first derivative would be s e to the st, and then just v out is just e to the st. And then basically we'll just divide through by e to the st, since every term has that. And so we'll end up getting an s squared term from here, an s term from here, and a no s, just a constant term from here. The, we basically just defined alpha and omega naught squared. Those didn't inherently come from this equation. In this case, two alpha is just going to be r over l, and omega naught squared is going to be one over l c. But this is just our general form that we use, where the coefficient of the linear term is two alpha, and then the constant term is omega naught squared. One key thing to remember is that you always need to make sure that your coefficient of s squared is 1. Right? If we like multiplied everything through by a billion, this equation would still hold because we have 0 on the right hand side. But 2 alpha and omega naught squared wouldn't be as they should be. So we'll actually go through and just look at, look at that. Um, so remember that v out equals v homogeneous plus v particular, where v homogeneous satisfies this equation equals zero. So you set your, your sources, you turn them off. Um, so what we'll do then is assume that v out takes some form that looks like a e to the st, as Jacob was saying. And if we plug this in, then note that uh, the first derivative of this looks like a s e to the st. The second derivative looks like a s squared e to the st. We just double. Perfect. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so if we plug this in, we have a s squared e to the st plus r over l 
uh, a s e to the s t plus uh, one over l c a e to the s t equals zero. Uh, board space. Uh, <coughs> okay. This is homogeneous. Yeah. Free, so it's equal to zero. Yeah. So we set it equal. Okay, so the A's cancel out, and furthermore, the E's cancel out. And so that's where we get this form of S squared plus 2 alpha S plus omega naught squared equals 0. And since we were trying to solve this as our solution, we would solve to find the value of S. Does that make sense so far? So we're guessing that we have an exponential solution um, because exponentials are kind of the generic component that comprise functions. So we're guessing that our function, our solution contains that, and we've just kind of plugged it in, solved, and now to further solve for this, we'll need to find you know a and, and s. Um, so I'll rewrite this s squared equals r over oops s squared plus r over l s plus one over l c equals zero. So just by pattern matching, because our coefficient of s squared is 1 here, we know that this is in the correct form. So we see that 2 alpha is equal to r over l, and omega naught squared is equal to 1 over lc. And the values of omega naught squared and 2 alpha end up being relevant for a lot of analysis that we'll do on our circuit. OK, so then kind of the last step, and I'll just write it in terms of this one so that you kind of see the generic solution. So we would have. If we're solving this and it's a function of s, then we'll just uh, do what we normally do. It's a quadratic equation for s. Uh, so we have s equals negative 2 alpha plus minus square root of uh, 4 alpha squared minus 4 omega squared all over 2. And this is kind of why we've added this factor of 2 in front of alpha for our definition, just because it makes this easier. This is negative alpha plus or minus the square root pulling out the 4. So we get a 2 in front, and that cancels. So we have alpha squared minus omega naught squared. OK, so this brings us to a discussion about damping. So note that ultimately, so we have two values of s. And remember, we guessed that our solution was of the form a to e to the st. So ultimately, what we'll look like is we'll have some a e to the s1 t, where that comes from the plus sign, plus some b e to the s2 t, where the other one comes from the negative sign. So we have two solutions here. So if alpha squared is bigger than omega naught squared, so this one. Alpha squared is bigger than omega naught squared. This term is positive, and so we'll end up with two real solutions. And if we go back to our equation, what uh, our, our value of alpha was this r over l, and our value of omega naught was the square root of 1 over lc. So you can think about it that alpha is related to our resistance and inductance, and omega naught is re related to this term. So this is kind of telling us about damping. Um, One thing to note is that those these values for alpha and omega naught are only because we're analyzing a specific circuit and looking at the output voltage at a specific point. If we were to lay out our circuit in any other way or measure the output voltage across anything else, we could get different values. Yeah. So in this case, this would be for the you know particular thing r over l, l squared r squared over l squared is uh, greater than one over l c. So r squared is greater than l over c. So kind of what this case means is we have a really big resistor is one way to think about it. So you would call this overdamped. One reason to think of it as like over damped is just because, as we know, right, inductors and capacitors can store energy, whereas resistors like dissipate energy. And so, if you have a very large resistance, it's dissipating a lot. It's like over damping the system. Yeah. Um, okay. And in this case, our two solutions, so V out will be 
Um, let's see, we'll call this, oh, I get to that in a minute. So we'll have a e to the s1 t plus b e to the s2 t. And we have a negative term here, so it's possible both of these will be negative. Um, so what that will mean, well, actually they will be because the magnitude of this term is smaller than the magnitude of this term. So this, both of these solutions will be negative. And what that means is if we have the sum of two uh, exponentials that are decaying, our total solution is going to decay. Um, so one, one, sorry, one other thing to notice is like you might be wondering if V out is just A E V S T, how are we getting two terms? The reason is the entire notion of a homogeneous solution is basically looking at possible solutions that cause the whole thing to be zero. And so what we found is that there are two possible values for s that we could use here that make everything work out right. such that that equation equals zero. And so either of those two or any linear combination of them will also lead to the whole thing equaling zero. Uh, okay, so in this case, the solution, if we plotted it over time, it would just look something like this as it decays, as the resistor dissipates energy in the circuit and the voltage falls away. Uh, any questions on this one? Okay. Yeah. So the second one is when this term alpha squared minus omega naught squared is equal to zero. minus omega naught squared is equal to zero. We call this critically damped. And in this case, we only end up with one solution for S. Um, so we have V out equals A E to the S T, where S is negative, and again, this decays, uh, but it's there's also a second term, right? Plus B T E to the S T. Yeah. It, it's it's a confusing like differential equations thing where because this is at like the exact breaking point where that second plus or minus term goes to zero, the only solution to this is S is minus alpha. But then as far as I know, it turns out that like solving the second order system, we could also get a term like A T E to the S T or something like that. Nonetheless, because e to the st is a decaying exponential, that <coughs> decays faster than the linear t term increases. And so once again, we're overall going to have this kind of decaying looking thing. It's just going to look a little bit strange because we have this t term. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that, but it is good to remember that. Yeah. Probably nothing like this will come up. Uh, this is very much an edge case. Um, Okay, and then the final case, which is like the main case we're going to see in this class, is going to be underdamped. And this is when alpha squared is less than omega naught squared. Okay, if alpha squared is less than omega naught squared, then alpha squared minus omega naught squared is less than zero, which means that the negative of that we could write it as negative omega naught squared minus alpha squared. Okay, this is all like very trivial looking, but the reason we do this is that if we know we're acting in this critically, uh, sorry, uh, underdamped. underdamped, thank you, underdamped, 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 so like the resistor isn't resi like dissipating that quickly, we're going to end up seeing a negative under the square root, right? So this term is positive. Right, we're basically going to get Hannah's analysis earlier is so what it meant to be overdamped. We're going to get the same equation except this inequality is going to be flipped. So now r squared is less than L over C, which means that we don't have a lot of resistance, which means that we're underdamped. Yeah. Exact. So we're going to be seeing in this in the operation of this circuit, we're going to be seeing a lot of the behavior from the L and C components that and L's and C's they kind of do oscillation type things. We're going to be seeing a lot of that behavior rather than just this dissipative resistive behavior. So the reason I read it like this is then when we look at our solution for S, we say S is equal to negative alpha plus or minus 
And if you have the square root of something that's negative, you can pull out a factor of j, or i, um, the imaginary number. And we can then write it as the square root of omega naught squared minus alpha squared. So this is why we define this new thing called omega d, which is just this term. So omega d squared is equal to omega naught squared minus alpha squared. And so we're only really going to define omega d when we're in this underdamped situation in the first place. Um, okay, so. Yeah. Um, so what does the plot of this look like? Well, what does the solution look like? We have, I'll go over here for the time being. So we had a e to the st. So this is going to give us some a times e to the minus alpha plus, so the first solution is a positive solution, plus j omega d. And the second solution is b e to the minus alpha minus j omega d. And the key thing about this is the way we can do math with complex uh, with exponentials is that we can separate it. So we have a e to the minus alpha times e to the j omega d plus b e to the minus alpha times e to the minus j omega d. All of these roots of t. Uh, yes. <coughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, All these terms have a yeah. T on them. They got lost on me. Oh, right, because, yeah, this was the value of S in here, and then the solution gives us back our time. Um, so, yeah, we're multiplying this all by time. Um, and why is this important? Well, we know that this has some uh, special form from, from math where if omega d is a real number, yeah, sorry. So this is assuming that it's underdamped, correct? This is in the underdamped okay. situation, yes. Um, in the overdamped or critic, in, in the overdamped solution, all you have is is this uh, two real and negative solutions. So they're both going to decay away. So yes, only for um, underdamped. Underdamped. And note that we defined omega d squared to be positive. Right, because we we're only doing this in the case where omega naught squared minus alpha squared is positive, so omega d is going to be a real number. Yeah. Okay, so we know that we have this formula for math that is that e to the j phi is equal to cosine of phi plus j sine phi. So what this means is when we're dealing with the underdamped situation, instead of having decaying behavior, we end up with an oscillating behavior multiplied by some decaying behavior. So remember, alpha had to do with our <coughs> resistive term and uh, the energy loss due to that resistance. So we're still going to have that because there's still a resistor in there, but it's not the primary factor influencing things. We're going to have this sinusoidal term. Um, so when we're plotting this, we're ultimately going to end up with something that is this, what we call the envelope, which is if the same envelope that we would have if it were just purely resistive. So this is a decaying exponential e to the negative alpha t. And then we're modulating this sinusoid. So if a sinusoid has a constant magnitude, we're modulating the magnitude of it. So it would be going something like this. And I don't have enough room here, but it would be like this. Just to expand on the drawing, one other way to think about this is that right, <coughs> the maximum value for e to the j omega d t is going to be 1. The minimum value is going to be negative 1, um, basically because of this. But the idea is this is going to be some sinusoid, the magnitude of this term is just 1. Um, and so that means that as e to the minus alpha t decays, we're going to get something that looks like this, where this sinusoid is basically stuck in between these 
two decreasing values. Yeah. Um, okay, so this led us to, let's see, uh, I guess we can just put it up here. Um, a couple, like, kind of numeric things that we measured in lab. So one was quality factor. And you probably have repeated this formula many times now, uh, but quality factor written as Q is defined as uh, omega naught squared, uh, sorry, omega naught over 2 alpha. Um, um, why does this make sense? What does this mean? Well, omega naught is talking about, omega naught is related to omega D from here. You can think of omega naught as kind of like the natural resonating frequency of your circuit if we weren't worried about all of the dissipation. And then alpha is essentially the speed of the dissipation. Right. So, uh, yeah, there's, you could define it as either omega naught. Technically, it is omega d over 2 alpha, but most of the time, um, alpha will be pretty small so that omega naught and omega d are fairly close in value. Um, this is kind of a small detail, but keep that in mind. You, yeah, one other thing to notice is that this actual oscillation is with frequency omega d, not omega naught, right? Because in these terms we have j, omega d, t, and the exponent. Right. Um, but yeah, again, assuming that alpha is pretty small, meaning the system doesn't have too much resistance in it, so it's going to oscillate a lot, then omega d is going to be closer to omega naught. Um, and the limit of that is if there's no resistor, it is a purely oscillatory circuit, there's no dissipation, and in that case, omega d equals omega naught. Um, okay, so we have quality. Any questions about that? Okay, uh, so quality factor. Um, actually, yeah, I guess the other ones we'll define later. Uh, but yeah, sorry, is it? Would you, if it's technically omega d over 2 alpha, would you say it's safer to do the calculation using that, or is it generally? It really depends on your application. Um, hopefully they will specify, like on an exam or something, which they mean if they ask you. Um, I guess for safety, probably say that you realize it kind of could be defined as either one. Um, yeah. I'm like sure we've usually used omega naught. I think naught. we've usually used omega naught. Um, we can we could clarify that for you and get back to you, um, but yeah, like you know when you're in lab and you're just trying to get a vague sense of what your quality factor is for you know your filter or whatever, it's very quick to use omega naught because it comes from that that term in your differential equation. So it's a function of R, L, and C, and that's really quick to calculate. Versus like it's going to take a little bit longer if you're going to be doing you know the square root of omega naught squared minus alpha squared. It's just a little bit longer. Um, so yeah. do you have any? No, I mean, I, I would probably err on the side of using omega naught over 2 alpha, just since that's generally how we've defined things in all of the notes. Okay. Um, we can post something on Piazza yeah, we'll check on in the next day <laughs> or so to clarify. But, okay. yeah. but yeah, so just realize they're similar, slightly different. Um, okay, and then the intuition for the quality factor. So alpha has to do with how much resistance there is. If it doesn't, if it's not a very dissipative circuit, then you're going to get a lot of oscillations per uh, alpha, which is your decay. So if it, if it gives you a lot of oscillations per decay, it has kind of a high quality factor. Um, like it's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't decay away, it doesn't dissipate as much. Um, so that's kind of the intuition for why omega naught's in the top and alpha's in the bottom. Um, OK, anything else you want to add to RLC? No, I think that's, okay. any questions on that? Yes. <coughs> is this quality factor, factor formula true for any RLC circuit? Yes. So we have that this this comes from, um, like, you can calculate. So the kind of actual definition is how how many oscillations um, occur per, per uh, a, a single time period of decay. So that definition of it comes from omega d and alpha. And omega d and alpha, remember, were very general, coming from the differential equation that had that specific form. Right. It can be a little bit confusing just because we have used 
all of these different terms, omega naught, alpha, q, all these different things for a bunch of different circuits, and it seems like it sometimes changes, and we have multiple understandings of what q can mean and stuff like that. The safest way to go is just to remember that we have defined them such that if you get this as your characteristic equation and make sure the coefficient of s squared is 1, then you could just grab 2 alpha and omega naught squared straight from there, and that is the 2 alpha and omega naught squared for your circuit. And then q is just going to be omega naught over 2 alpha. Everything else will fall from there. Okay. Final, oh, yeah. Can you talk about like notch frequency and using the quality factor for that, like band stuff? Yeah, we'll get to that when we switch to sinusoidal steady state. Um, so before we get there, the last thing to note is because we were talking about time here and things that change, that means we have initial conditions. And when we have initial conditions, that means that this solution is close, but not quite there. So we would have to then go back and figure out the solution for the particular equation where the problem says, you know, V across the capacitor at time zero is, you know, zero or 10 volts or whatever, and, and figure that out. And then you would add the two solutions. Right, just to clarify, like V in, whatever, we did all of this assuming that V in was equal to zero. So if we actually use whatever value of V in was provided for us, that'll give us the particular solution. So our final solution would basically be this guy plus whatever the particular solution was. Once we have that, then we can use initial conditions to set these constants A and B, and then we would have the full correct solution for a problem. Questions on that? Okay. Yeah, probably for figuring out how to solve uh, these equations with particular solutions, just do problems, practice, like read through the official solutions, because um, it can be a little tricky, mostly just computationally. Um, okay. So I know someone's going to say. Yeah. I mean, Do we have any Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. All right, so it will often be easier when we're dealing with these complicated circuits rather than rather than doing everything like this with all these differential equations, we have a shortcut using impedance. So the way to think about impedance is to remember that things were a lot easier when we just had resistors because then everything was just linear and we could just combine resistors in series or parallel. As soon as we started adding in capacitors and inductors, things got more complicated, and now we're dealing with second order differential equations. We could have some crazy circuit with like a billion capacitors and inductors, and that would be a billion order differential equation. So what we end up liking to do is we want to treat everything as a resistor, right? And the way we do that is we start with our device laws. So you know, VR equals R times IR, and then IC equals C, PVC, DT, and VL equals L, VIL, DT. So the way we make capacitors and inductors look like resistors is to basically assume that all of the signals in our circuit are complex exponentials, which is a reasonable way to go about things since every signal that we have can be decomposed into a bunch of complex exponentials. So we're basically going to assume that everything looks like this, A e to the j omega t, where A is your amplitude and then omega is the frequency. So this is a special case of what we were doing before, which was when we were solving our problem generically, like in time with any kind of input, we assumed our solution was e to the st, where s could be any type of number. What we're doing for sinusoidal steady state is then saying, Actually, in most cases, we're not going to have uh, like an exponentially increasing or decreasing source. Like our source will oscillate, and so an oscillating source is a particular case of e to the st, where s is then a complex, purely uh, a imaginary. purely imaginary number. Um, so the amplitudes are going to change for different things. So like you know, vr versus vc versus vl, they might have different amplitudes. But the idea is that if we've applied an input at a single frequency omega, then all of the resulting fre uh, frequencies of these different signals, they're all going to have frequency omega. And so that's going to simplify things a lot because the key point here is that the derivative of e to the j omega t is j omega times e to the j omega t. So then what we're going to end up getting is VR equals R times IR. That's already good. It's linear. But dVCDT, this is just going to equal 
if VC looks something like this, then when we differentiate this, the J omega is going to pull out in front and everything else is going to stay the same. So dvc dt is just equal to J omega times VC. Similarly, when we differentiate IL, same thing's going to happen. We just get J omega times IL. And so now we can rewrite these guys to look like Ohm's law. And so we're going to get VC equals 1 over J omega C times IC, and VL equals J omega L um, times IL. And so these values in parentheses here, which are basically in place of the resistance R for a resistor, those are the complex impedances for a capacitor and an inductor. Impedance is basically this generalized notion of resistance. Um, and so at first, did you Yeah, so one thing to note is these terms that we've written here are the coefficients. So when we substituted this whole term, <coughs> if we said that VC was equal to this term and we substituted it into the whole equation, when we, we would end up canceling out the e to the j omega t, um, and we would be left with VC and IC, where VC and IC are kind of these coefficients. So this is the representation in frequency space. And if we wanted to get back to a situation where we were saying v of C, VC of t is related to IC of t, we would multiply the whole equation by e to the j omega t. And this is what defines our, our phasors. So these things we would be calling phasors. And we have this relationship that v of t is equal to v phasor times e to the j omega t. And we have this defined for voltage, for current. Um, basically, because we're only having one frequency in our circuit, we only have this one omega frequency in our circuit, we can kind of not think about it. Um, all, of, all of these terms are going to drop out of our, our math and our equations, and we'll be left with relationships between the phasors. Right, so, so all of these guys should have those. Any questions on this? Because I know this can be really confusing. important to note is time independence. So all of the time dependence in our V of T expression is contained in the sinusoidal term. <clears throat> all right, so the reason this is so useful is because we still have it. Okay, the reason this is so useful is because now if we wanted to look at one of these more complicated RLC circuits, we can now find the transfer function from the input to the output in a much simpler manner. And the way we do it is this. So if we have the in. Yeah. The resistor inductor, capacitor, and we're measuring V out over here. We could do what Hannah did before, which is derive off the second order differential equation and then figure out if we're under damped, critically damped, or over damped, and go from there. However, we can also do this. Now, we can more or less model inductor and capacitor as resistors. So, more generally, now, we have our input, and we generally draw things like this when we're doing complex impedance where everything is just this like rectangular box, which you can kind of just think of as like a generalized resistor. So the impedance of this guy is R, that's just the resistor. Then we have the inductor with impedance J omega L, we have the capacitor with impedance 1 over J omega C. And now we can just do this as if it were just a voltage divider. Right now, if the output voltage is over here, then we're going to get that V out over V in is just equal to this impedance, so 1 over J omega C over the series combination of all of them, so R plus 
j omega l plus 1 over j omega c. And just multiplying top and bottom by j omega c, we'll clean this up a lot. It'll just be 1 over 1 minus omega squared lc plus j omega rc. And this equation um, looks similar to what we had before. If we divide through by lc, so this would give us that term up top. However, if we, let's say, if we divide both the top and bottom by lc, then we get 1 over lc. Yeah, so, right, we'll get 1 over LC, or I should write this in different order, I'll replace it with us in a second. Yeah. We'll get minus omega squared plus J omega R over L, and then plus 1 over LC, and Remember how we were saying before that this is the special case where s is purely imaginary? So like s is going to equal j omega? Well, if we replace j omega here by s, and minus omega squared is the same as j omega squared, right? because j squared is negative 1. So this minus omega squared is the same as just positive s squared. And now we've derived the exact same equation that Hannah got before, but this took a lot less time. So in particular, if we, if we see, so this is v out over v in. If we cross multiply both sides of the equation, we have v out times, and I'm going to cross multiply and expand. So s squared times v out plus s times r over l, I'll say r over l times s, v out plus 1 over LC v out equals v in. Yes. <laughs> I have to think about getting that. Um, right, so we just cross multiply. And then we remember, um, and if you were taking notes, you would have this a couple pages back, but the S came from assuming that our solutions looked like a e to the st. Right, so V out is AE to the ST, V prime out is S A E to the ST, V double prime, S squared. And so if we took this, where remember we're talking about phasers over here. So this side is sinusoidal steady tape. So everything we talk about, our vol all of our voltages and currents are phasers. So V out here was technically phaser and begin with a phaser. And now remember that we have something in time is equal to our phaser times e to the st. So if we multiply this whole equation by e to the st, we can then return to our time domain. So this term becomes, well, I'll start with this one, this is easier. V out times e to the st was simply the definition of V out of t. V out e to the st is V out, but when we have s times our exponential, that is equal to the first derivative. So this term gives us V prime out of t, and this term gives us v double prime out of t. And now we've recovered precisely the equation that we have up there from time. Yeah. Does that make sense? So we're writing, we're solving the same circuit in two ways. We solved it in the time domain by saying we have generic exponentials that comprise our solution. And we solved it in the you know, frequency domain by saying we have e to the j omega. Like instead of having a generic s, we have a complex number. But ultimately, these two methods are the exact same thing. Here, we just kind of throw some things behind the hood by talking about phasers and canceling out the e to the st terms. Um, 
but it is in fact the exact same thing we did before. Uh, so one way to solve your circuits would be to solve them as if you were doing sinusoidal steady state, and that recovers you your original differential equation. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is that it means that because over here, um, and when I'm saying over here, I mean what we erased a couple minutes ago, um, we define a meganaut squared to be the coefficient of our uh, zeroth derivative term, and we de defined two alpha to be the coefficient of our first derivative term. There's no plus sign. Oh, that's not plus sign. Um, because these these definitions came from over here when we were talking about time, then the same def uh, definitions apply over here when we're doing sinusoidal steady state. And then if we go back one level, we see that this came from cross multiplying. Uh, and in particular, this part of the differential equation was the denominator. So when we go back over here, then this term is going to be our 2 alpha. This is our omega naught squared. And we can identify those same things as coming from when we had s equal to j omega. Right, so whenever you derive your transfer function for your circuit, if it's a second order circuit, you should be able to get your denominator into this form. And notice the reason I divided by LC on top and bottom from this to this is so that my S squared term would have a coefficient of 1, because that was our rule earlier in order to know that we were in the correct form. So if you find your transfer function for a second order system, put it in this form and make sure that this coefficient is 1, then you can just read off 2 alpha and omega naught squared for your circuit from there. Was there a question in the front? I think I saw a hand raise. Okay. Questions? I personally find this very mind blowing. Oh, yeah. Uh, where did the A coefficient go? The A coefficient. Um, let's see. Uh, so this would have been if, yeah, so I guess if we define V in in terms of, uh, or I think it would all just, it all just canceled out. Yeah, sorry. Uh, good question, yeah. So when we multiplied everyth everything by e to the st, we also could have multiplied it by a um, and then collected that into our v out. Um, this, does that make sense? So those were just all the terms that canceled out. Yeah. Um, what is the significance of the numerator of the transfer function? I mean, that's going to ultimately have to do with the right-hand side of our equation like sort of how Vn then affects all of this. If you were just hoping to analyze your circuit and like the homogeneous response of it or something like that, then you wouldn't really care about the numerator, but it ends up just defining this right-hand side, which so, will then have to do with like a particular solution. Or something. So the kind of additional nice thing is when we solved the RLC circuit before, we set Vn equal to zero and looked at the homogeneous solution first. Um, and it's usually easier to, to find the equation for the circuit when you're not looking at uh, Vn, but um, here you kind of get that all immediately. Um, yeah, so the numerator is your, your input. On the practice exam, they ask us to factor each of the, um, like the denominator and the numerator of the transfer function. Like, how far do we have to simplify stuff on this exam? Can I, can I just like write the quadratic formula and say that's what that should be, that's what that should be, and then? Maybe we can check on that. We, yeah, we are not the experts on grading, but we'll get back to, get back to you on We that. don't get to see the exams or anything, yeah. so that we can't bias you guys when leaving the session, <laughs> so. Um, I would suspect if they're, were they asking you to factor like the denominator here? Uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so one. You mean like to find the roots, or? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know exactly what the problem is looking for. However, I mean, we basically did, I and mean, that was what was Han That is what Hannah was doing before when we started from the time domain, and we were solving that quadratic equation that led to the three cases. So, like inherently, you yeah. should probably just get those values. You should be get like you know minus alpha plus or minus root omega naught squared minus alpha squared, and, and that should be it. Um, so, like. Presumably, since you now have two alpha and omega not right from here, you should be able to factor that in a pretty straightforward way. And also, I think, yeah, you could just go from here. So omega d was, um, right. and check that you're I mean, this assumes it's under damped. Right, so check that you're under damped. Um, well, I mean, either way, right, your, your solution yeah, is always true. just going to be s equals minus alpha plus or minus root, what was it, alpha squared minus alpha omega Alpha squared minus omega d, yeah, there you go, perfect. 
right? These were always our two solutions for s. And we already have alpha and omega naught from writing it in right. this form. So you should be able to get the factors just from there. And that is useful because then these are the actual coefficients of your, yeah, these are actually the exponents of your exponential terms. So that is probably why they were asking you to factor it, but I'm not sure what the problem is. Another reason they might ask you to factor it is if you express this as, if this became 1 over LC over some S minus A times S minus B, this would tell you kind of important behavior about your function. So this is why we're calling it a second order equation. It has two solutions, two roots. Um, and if you were to plug in, so if you were looking at the two frequencies that were related to A and B, then this function would like blow up at those uh, frequencies. So those have a special name. Um, and other classes will go into them more than this one. Uh, but yeah, factoring the denominator of this tells you a lot about uh, what the graph of that function looks like. All right, are there any other questions about this or about the time domain, how it links to the frequency domain? Because if not, we're going to stick with the frequency domain and start talking about filters. So any last questions? All right. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Is it okay to erase this one or I, we can leave it up a bit longer? I think we can leave it up for, I think this yeah. should be okay. Better. Oftentimes, now that we're using this transfer function methodology, we're going to have equations that look something like this, where we have you know, numerator and denominator, and it's in terms of omega and such. And this is the transfer function from our input to our output. And this allows us now to design frequency selective filters. So, generally, right, that transfer function, even though it's big and messy and has a numerator and denominator, it is a complex number, right? Um, I think it would be a good idea just to briefly say a few things about complex numbers. Right? Complex numbers, we have the real axis, we have the imaginary axis. And so, you know, like this number might be like 4 plus 3j or something like that. We're used to writing complex numbers in Cartesian form. In this class, for the most part, it is going to be a lot more useful to write them all as r e to the j theta, so as Hannah said before, by Euler's formula, this is just r <coughs> cos theta plus r j sine theta. And so by choosing the correct theta and r, theta ends up just being this angle, and then r ends up being the length of your vector. This is a really helpful way to write things, because in general, we're going to be dividing them, right? If your transfer function, which we'll often write as like h of omega, is equal to, you know, some function of omega on top. Over some function of omega on the bottom. Each of these is going to be a complex number. Real numbers are also complex numbers, right? So like in general, we can always just express the numerator and denominator in these forms. And it's useful because just these terms, right, whenever you divide two real numbers, you can just write that as r1 over r2. But then when you divide exponentials, the exponents just subtract. So this just becomes e to the j theta 1 minus theta 2. And now we've gone from a numerator and denominator, each which were complex numbers with their own magnitudes and phases. Now we've easily gotten it to the total fractions, magnitude and phase. Magnitudes multiply or divide, phases add or subtract. Um, so that's a very useful model to use. So if they ever, and they will, um, you know, ask you for the, the phase of h of j omega, then the, the magnitude would be taking the ratio of the two magnitudes, and the, the phase of that would be taking, subtracting the phases of the two, the numerator and the denominator. So if you can identify 
the numerator as a magnitude and phase and the denominator as a magnitude and phase, then you can easily find uh, the magnitude and phase of the transfer function. Right. So we will often give you guys problems that look something like this, where we have this circuit, and we'll say, you know, what if V in, you know, is equal to 5 sine of omega t. And omega could be anything, but for simplicity, I'll just leave it as omega. So we can't just directly stuff this in, right? Because this isn't exactly you know, a e to the j omega t or something like that. The way I like to think about how this works is that the actual input to our circuit, the actual v in over there, is this. It's 5 sine of omega t. But analyzing our, our circuit from that perspective is going to get very messy, and we don't want to do that. So we invent this fake input to our circuit. So this is the actual input. We invent a fake input which we'll say is 5e to the j omega t, right? This isn't the actual input to our circuit. This is a complex number. Our voltages are always going to be real. When you go to lab and plug stuff in, you're never going to get complex numbers. But we say that this is our fake input to our circuit. And we choose this one specifically because, the, in this case, the imaginary part of our fake input is equal to our actual. If our actual input were a cosine, then this would be the real part of, but you can do it either way. And so it works out really nicely that if we apply a fake input to our circuit and then analyze and solve the entire thing, then at the output side, it will have kept sort of the real and imaginary parts separate. So what that means is we are going to apply our fake input to the circuit. We're going to solve the entire circuit, get our fake output. And then at the very end, we're just going to take the imaginary part of our fake output to get our actual output. One thing that people often mess up on is to take the imaginary part too early. You have to solve the entire circuit and be ready to box your answer and move on to the next question, and then remind yourself, oh, take the imaginary part. Very last step. Another way to do this um, is, is to say that if you start with your Vn equals your 5 sine omega t, and then it goes through our, you know, our filter that looks like h of j omega, where h of j omega is equal to, it has some magnitude, and it has some phase, so I'll say e to the j phi, um, where phi depends on omega, then what you'll get out, <coughs> what you'll get out when this is your input would then be in a similar way, you multiply the magnitude, so you have 5 times the magnitude of your transfer function, and the phases add. So instead of sine omega t, you have sine omega t plus phi. So this would also work if you had a cosine. So if you put in 5 cosine omega t, then you'd end up with the same magnitude, but cosine omega t plus phi. Um, the reason this works is from what Jacob was showing, um, when, and as he said, like, when you do this math, it keeps the imaginary part and real part separate. Uh, so when you go and multiply the real part and imaginary part by this function, this phase will add to the cosine, and this phase will add to the sine part. And it will do that independently. So then when you go to take the imaginary part or real part to recover the sine or cosine, it will, be prop it will have been properly adjusted by here. So you can skip that step and just go to the output, which is adding on your phase and multiplying in your magnitude. Yeah, all of these ways of thinking about things, they're, they're all equivalent. We talked about phasers. Hannah just talked about the, the gain versus the phase shift from your transfer function. I was talking about actual and fake inputs and actual and fake outputs. These are all the same thing. One important thing to note, if you do want to think about it, like I personally think about it as actual versus fake inputs and outputs, be very careful to keep in your mind using the words actual versus fake rather than real versus fake or real versus imaginary because then you'll get very confused. So actual and fake. Um, yeah, just a side note.
So. So a uh, kind of helpful thing to, to do both uh, for your own purposes so that when you're working in a lab and trying to figure out what kind of filter you want and how you would make that filter, or on an exam just to be able to, you know, you get some messy equation because you've done a lot of algebra and then maybe you want to be able to kind of test it and make sure that it kind of matches your intuition. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, it involves... <coughs> realizing a couple things, and we had a similar idea of thinking about this when we were doing Thevenin and Norton, but if we have a capacitor and omega equals zero, so if omega equals zero, there's no frequency, otherwise known as uh, DC, um, this would be a constant voltage, so those are all the same things. If there's, a, if omega is equal to zero, so there's no changing voltage, then we can figure out that the capacitor actually has a special behavior. In particular, omega equals zero, so no, the voltage is constant, then we have that it looks like an open. Another way of seeing this directly from the math is to just look at the impedances. So one other thing, as I was saying before, where capacitors and inductors are kind of flipped, right? With the capacitor, it's one over J omega C, but for the inductor, it's just J omega L. So, right, if omega equals zero, then this is one over zero, which is infinite. So if we have an infinite impedance, that's like a resistor with infinite resistance, no current is going to get through there, which is why it looks like an open circuit. Alternatively, if omega were equal to infinity, then this would be one over infinity, which is zero. And so this would be a zero resistance. It would just look like a short circuit. It would just look like a wire. The definition of wire is something that has no resistance drop across it, no voltage drop across it. Um, and then, as Jacob was saying earlier, we have this kind of duality between resistors and capacitors. So, whereas a capacitor has an omega equals zero, it's an open, the inductor is the other way around. So, an omega equals zero, it looks like a short. And another way to see that is you plug in zero for here and you get that the impedance is zero. So, something with zero impedance, impedance is like resistance, it's a short. Um, and similarly for the last case, uh, open. And the, keeping these two rules in mind, I find to be very useful sanity checks if you've just done something. So like for example, in this circuit up here, right, if we have our R, L, C, and I want to see roughly if I think what I got was correct. Well, because a capacitor at high frequencies should look like a short circuit, a wire has zero voltage drop across it. So whatever answer I got, if omega is really, really big, I should expect V out to be roughly zero. Alternatively, when omega equals zero, the capacitor looks like an open. Well, if this were an open circuit, then there would be no current flowing through anything which would mean that there would be no voltage drop across the inductor, no voltage drop across the resistor, I should expect that V out would roughly equal V in. So when we look at our transfer function, if we make omega equal zero, well then these two terms go away and we get one over one, so V out equals V in as we would expect. Whereas... So this wire is like literally connected to V in, no current flows through the circuit, so... Oh, uh, well the inductor was short at... Um, yeah, so I like to, when I'm oh, doing this intuitively, different. like redraw the circuit at the extreme cases. So what I did here was I said, okay, at omega equals zero, the capacitor is a short, so it's an open. The inductor, sorry, the capacitor is an open, so it's an open. Uh, inductor is a short, and I redrew it, and then you can realize no current flows. So this point is equal to the voltage at this point, V out is V in, which is. And we see that from the transfer function. If we make omega go to infinity, then everything is going to flip, and now the inductor is going to look like an open. Whereas the capacitor is going to look like a short. And so if we're just measuring a voltage drop across two sections of the same wire, we should expect to get zero. And in fact, when we plug in omega equals infinity, this denominator is going to be huge, and the numerator is one, we get zero. 
one thing that we've kind of skated over here is that what we're really talking about right now is the gain of our filter rather than the phase, right? As, as Hannah was saying before, the phase shift basically just shifts our sine or cosine wave in terms of the gain of the circuit that comes from the magnitude of our transfer function. So really what we should have been doing here is we should have taken the magnitude of this transfer function and then analyzed that at omega equals zero and omega equals infinity rather than just doing it straight. It turns out that because things either became infinite or zero, it worked out to be the same thing. But strictly, we should take the magnitude of that. And what we're going to get is the magnitude of the top guy is just one. The magnitude of the bottom, right, we have the square root of the real part squared, 1 minus omega squared LC squared plus the imaginary part squared, so plus omega RC squared. So this is actually the magnitude of our transfer function. And then, as we said, if omega equals 0, we're just left with a 1, as we had before. And if omega equals infinity, then this is huge, and we get 1 over a huge thing, and we get 0. And just a note on complex numbers, like identifying that this is the real part, this is the imaginary part. So when we're looking at on the real imaginary plane, we have the real part and the imaginary part. And the magnitude literally means like the, the length of that vector. And you can find that using uh, like the Pyth Pythagorean theorem, basically, is what is written here. One just semantics thing, the imaginary part of, an, of a complex number does not include the j. So that's why we keep saying the imaginary part. The j is multiplied by the imaginary part. So the imaginary part is actually a real number, which is confusing, but just keep it in mind. Yeah. Um, so this leads us into, we talked about omega equals zero, omega equals infinity, uh, and this leads us to talking about what happens when omega is not either of those things. Um, so this is, um, so there's like a couple ways to see this, uh, that there's a special behavior. At, uh, at something that's not either of those values. One way is to look at the denominator of this transfer function, and we notice that when 1 minus omega squared LC is equal to 0, then this term is going to be minimized. Um, so it, we haven't set it to 0, uh, but we have, we're minimizing that. Um, in particular, we're, we're really trying to minimize this other thing that is the the magnitude. Uh, so if we think of minimizing the magnitude, one way to do so would be to try and eliminate one of these square terms. So if we set this term equal to zero, then we would be minimizing the denominator. Right. That isn't necessarily the absolute minimum of the denominator. Right. To find the absolute minimum of that denominator, you would have to differentiate it with respect to omega, set that equal to zero, and solve. But the point is sometimes these sort of special points that you see can be a useful midpoint to look at to see what the magnitude of your transfer function is at that point. So oftentimes a useful point to look at is the, um, you know, is the omega naught of your circuit, which in this case, as we found before, was 1 over root LC. And the reason that we're looking at a lot of cases, the uh, omega naught term, is that if we have some function that is has a numerator that's you know a function of omega, and the denominator is uh, in our favorite form, s squared plus 2 alpha plus omega naught squared. We read it, write it with uh, j omega, so we get f of j omega over substituting s equals j omega. Then this becomes minus omega squared, moving this omega naught squared over here, squared, plus 2. alpha j omega, um, and so the magnitude of this will have uh, the same form that Jacob wrote, where uh, we have omega naught equals omega uh, is a minimizing solution. So this is a special place where you should check the magnitude of the transfer function. Um, the reason that we're looking at all this, at the end of the day, oftentimes we want to make a plot like this where basically we want to look at the magnitude of our transfer function relative to omega. And oftentimes we'll do this on a logarithmic scale because it ends up looking nicer and we can pick out more important features from that. So oftentimes this will be in decibels, which we'll explain in a second, and this will also be logarithmic. 
Um, and these are log base 10, but that's the correct. specific point. Before we decipher exactly what decibels and log and everything mean, just from what we said before, right, when omega equals zero, then our transfer function, we end up getting one. So in decibels, that's actually zero. Right, so it starts here. Yeah. But then at omega equals infinity, we got zero, which is the log of, of zero is like negative infinity. So we know that we're gonna just end going like down. It's not exactly clear from that analysis sort of what happens in the middle, but as Hannah said, if we look at omega equals omega naught in our magnitude of transfer, omega naught in this case is one over root LC, so omega naught squared is one over LC. One over LC times LC is one, one minus one is zero. So this term goes away. So we're left with one over root omega RC squared, which I'm gonna write it down here. At omega equals omega naught, which in this case is one over root LC, we get that the magnitude of H of J omega is just one over omega RC which is, if we plug in omega equals one over root LC, then we'll get a root L over R root C, something like that. Okay. Either way, depending on your specific values of R, L, and C, you can see what that value is, but depending on So like it, it could, if that is greater than one, which it could be depending on your choices of L, C, and R, then we might get something that looks like this, where this goes above and then it tails off or something like that. It might be below one, in which case it would always stay below this line. But looking at these sort of special values can give you a bit of a better picture of what this is going to look like. So when I'm doing these intuitively, just trying to figure out generally what's going on, I often will not worry about like, that we're taking log of gain and log of omega, because uh, then you get into, you know, oh, like the log of zero is in, you know, negative infinity and these weird things. Um, and for the purposes of like figuring out intuitively what's going on, you could just think about like what the general shape is in a gain versus omega plot. Um, so if we go through, um, oh yeah, so, so when we were looking at this, we had the two extremes. So we had omega equals zero and omega equals infinity. And then we had this special case where we were at um, omega equals omega naught, in which case um, we, we ended up with the, only that term left. Um, and I think it can be helpful to see what is actually going on with the inductor capa and capacitor um, more specifically. So, so if we're kind of asking this question of why, like, why do we have this gain um, in the middle? Why do we have a gain that's bigger than one? Um, like, why is the circuit resonating? Um, and the way to think of that is that <coughs> as we're going from kind of there's like a spectrum, and on one end we have the inductor is an open and the capacitor is a short, to the other end of the spectrum where it's the other way around there's this point in the middle where their behavior cancels out. Um, so one way to see that is if we're looking at the sum of the impedance of the inductor and the capacitor, which is if we're looking at the output from here. Um, so let's actually just look at the circuit. So L and C. So if we look at what this does, on omega equals zero, and this is just not going to be with log, but just, oops. Uh, so when omega equals zero, one of them is an open and one of them is a short. Uh, so altogether, this is going to be an open if one of them is an open. 
So we'll say it's something up here. On the other hand, um, if omega is equal to infinity, again, one of them is an open, one of them is a short. So the whole thing is an open because they're in series. Then there's this value in the middle, and this brings us back to looking at the sum of the impedances. The impedance of an inductor is J omega L. The impedance of a capacitor is J omega C, one. Uh, 1 over J omega C. But we can use the fact that 1 over J, that J times J is defined as negative 1. So 1 over J is equal to negative J. And what this means is that we have J omega L minus J over omega C. And so from this perspective, we can see that at a specific value of omega, there's a possibility for the total impedance to cancel out. And that's what's going on when we have um, an inductor and capacitor in series. What happens at resonance, so this will be if we set that equal to zero, we'll get omega equals uh, square root of one over one over square root of LC, which is our, our resonance for an inductor and capacitor. And what it looks like at that resonance is a short. So this would yeah. Right, no, I was just going to say, if we factor that a little bit further, we see that this is equal to J times omega L minus 1 over omega C. And it turns out that if we stuff into there omega equals 1 over root L C, then this is equal to 0. You can just plug that in, you'll see that it equals 0. And then if the impedance of something equals 0, it looks like a wire, which is why we get something that looks like this. So this is you know, an inaccurate drawing. This is just vaguely what's going on is take both ends of the spectrum and then find the thing in the middle. Um, so the key takeaway is when an inductor and capacitor are in series, they have the ability to act like a short. Um, so regardless of what else was going on, this element together would kind of look just like a wire. So we can do the same thing looking at uh, an inductor and capacitor in parallel. Thank you. So we have uh, okay, so we do the same thing. Oh, one quick thing to note is just to remember that when we're drawing these inductors and capacitors in series or parallel, they're in the context of a larger circuit. In other yeah. words, if we just like put a capacitor and inductor together in lab, there would be no voltage drop across it unless they had initial you know, voltage on them or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so the, the reason this is helpful is like, say you have some big complicated circuit, then you can sim and you're looking at it at resonance, for example, then you can simplify kind of subcomponents of the circuit um, in this manner. Uh, okay, so we're looking at this circuit now, and whereas before one was an open and one was a short at omega equals zero, if we put those in, in series, then the total thing is going to look like an open. But if we put them in parallel, then there will always be a connection between them. So if the capacitor is the short and the inductor is the open, then there's a path from here to here, so it looks like a wire. And vice versa, if this is the, sh the open and this is the short, then there's a path from here to here, and it looks like a short on that side. So the behavior when you have an inductor and capacitor is going to look the same at omega equals zero and omega equals infinity. Um, so in this case, they both look like shorts at omega equals zero and omega equals infinity. And in, in this case, so here we had the sum of their impedances had a, a special value of omega such that the impedance looked like zero, it looked like a wire. In this case, remember when we add our generic, our you know generic blocks uh, in parallel. We have Z two. We have that it looks like one over Z one plus one over Z two inverse, which is Z one Z two over Z one plus Z two. So if we're looking at Z C and Z L, 
then the ZC and plus ZL that we computed over here is going to now appear in the denominator. So where before, when this term went to zero, the whole term, the whole thing went to zero, when this goes to zero now, it's going to zero in the denominator, so it's making this whole impedance from here to here blow up. Um, so if we have a really big impedance, we're going to get the V out as something big. Um, so kind of, we would get something vaguely that looks like this. Uh, any questions about this type of analysis? One other thing that has to do with that, but also what we were saying before, right? We found that at our resonant frequency at omega naught, it turned out the magnitude of our transfer function was this expression root L over R root C. Well, if we look back over here, we see that this is also equal to um, omega naught over two alpha, which, as we saw before, right, is the quality factor of our circuit. And so this actually makes a lot of sense because at our resonant frequency, we would hope that we would be getting more gain. And so the higher the quality factor, the more gain we're going to get. So that's just one further link with all of these different definitions and concepts. Um, so we mentioned before that we will often use decibels to uh, you know, as our unit basically. Decibels is a little bit of a confusing thing. It's not actually a unit. Decibels is just 20 log base 10 of something, of like whatever it is. So when we want the transfer function and then in decibels, what you do is you just literally do 20 log base 10 of, in this case, it's the magnitude of H of J omega. And then oftentimes we will do that, we will ask for like the slope or the plot in decibels per decade, and decade 10, right, that's like a factor of 10 increase in omega, which is why that um, scale is log base 10 of omega. Um, and so what you end up wanting to do is if you want it, it turns out that oftentimes different regions of this will look approximately linear. Right, so like we said that at this point it's going to be at zero, but then it rises up and it's at whatever this point is, and then it's going to go down. Oftentimes, not always, this will look approximately linear and this will look approximately linear um, in between sort of these extreme values. And so sometimes it's useful to think about sort of what the slopes of those linear segments are. And so the way you want to do that is, right, this is the expression for our y-axis. And our x-axis is in log omega. So if you want to figure out what the slope is of a certain segment, you would have to do the derivative with respect to log base 10 of omega of 20 log base 10 of the magnitude of h of j omega. And you're going to be evaluating this, like in general, if you like did this directly, you would get some very messy expression um, that would be dependent on what value of omega you're looking at. Like this would be some function of omega. That isn't what we want. Like yes, you could find some general equation for the slope of this at any point in terms of omega. That isn't the most useful to us. What we're really interested in is finding like what is the slope here as omega is approaching infinity, and then what is the slope here as omega is approaching zero. And so oftentimes you'll basically, it'll depend on the transfer function, but you'll want to look at your transfer function and then as omega approaches zero, or as omega approaches infinity, you can see which terms are dominating and therefore which terms you have to focus on and then only use those in this expression to find this value for that region, if that made sense. One general rule of thumb that's useful is oftentimes if you're designing like a low pass filter or something like that or a band pass filter where you want at higher frequencies it to roll off, it would be a better filter if it rolls off more quickly, if it decays more quickly. And so one simple rule of thumb, and this is not a general rule, like don't just you know write this on the you know on your exam, but this is just a general thing to keep in mind, is that if if the magnitude of h of j omega were proportional to like 1 over omega. Very simple model, if it were 1 over omega. Well, log base 10 
of 1 over omega is the same thing as log base 10 of omega to the minus 1, right? And by our logarithm rules, we can always pull an exponent out in front. So that is equal to minus log base 10 of omega. What we really want is 20 times that. So what we're really going to get for here is we're going to do d, d log omega of minus 20 log omega. And this is a very straightforward thing to evaluate. d d log omega of minus 20 log omega. It's just minus 20. And so that's why you often hear us talking about like a minus 20 decibels per decade roll off. It's because if, if the magnitude of h of j omega is related to 1 over omega, if that's kind of the scaling factor, you're going to get minus 20 or something like that. Um, also, if it were like 1 over omega squared, then all of these terms are going to square. We're going to get to the minus 2, um, which is going to be minus 2 log omega. And then this is going to be a minus 40. And we'll get minus 40. So that's why often you'll be having these multiples of negative 20 as your roll-offs. This does not apply to every case. And as I was saying before, we're often looking for the slope at different sections of our frequency response. So like this would be if, as omega, we're, pro we're approaching infinity, if the term that was most relevant to us was, you know, approximately 1 over omega squared, this is what we would get. So if you have, like, a denominator that has something that's 1 over omega squared plus something that's omega, uh, something like that, then at omega equals 0, you would consider, all right, let's say this is like a and b. So as omega equal goes to zero, this omega squared term is going to go to a zero a lot faster. So we would kind of be ignoring this term and looking at the decay having to do with b. But if omega is going to infinity, then omega squared is going to go to infinity a lot faster than omega. So at omega equals infinity, our slope would be more related to the coefficient a. Um, and so the yeah, as Jacob was showing, like when you take the derivatives, um, that will give you like precisely what you're going to want, and you don't really have to do any thinking. But if you have a transfer function and want to kind of think intuitively, or you know what you should expect, and even to do that to compare it to what you get through the derivative method, you can do that kind of thinking of like what term is your dominant term at each point. Uh, and just one more thing to notice is like if we had it in this form, we don't even need to take the derivative. Um, this would just be like. If you have y equals ax plus b, so x is your, your x-axis, then in that case, log of omega is our x-axis, and our output is y. So y equals minus 2 times x, so minus 2 is your slope. Um, um, let's see. That's, that's pretty much yeah. it. <laughs> Anybody have any questions about that? All right. Um, we can yeah. stick around for a little bit afterwards if anybody wants to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Come ask us yeah, things. Please come up, ask him. There will people. be office hours tomorrow. Um, we're always available by email. Um, TAs and the professors, good luck on the exam. <laughs> yeah.